All right. Good evening, everyone. Hey, thanks for joining again. We're all the way out into September. Uh, those of you who have, who have been with Team 3 in normal seasons know that uh, we don't normally go this long. Uh, but as long as there's still interest, I think we're going to keep pushing. Um, so we're, we're happy to have you here. And I, I knew every year we'd try to bring in a coach um, and, and give them the beat down and let them know why referees are right. Uh, no, actually, uh, try to try to broaden our perspectives. Uh, there's definitely something to learn. Uh, and if we could work with coaches, uh, we would have a, a better answer to was that a good idea, which is the year's theme. So I was, I was very excited to get uh, tonight's guest. Um, you know, in AYSO, you, there are some names you hear a lot. and you, I've been able to meet most of those revered names I hear about. Um, but there was one I'd, I'd heard here and there for a while, always positive things. And then when somebody was able to connect me with his phone number, I was pretty excited to get Alan Meter. Um, I will not uh, speak much more. He knows his uh, introduction better than I. And um, well, Alan, I'm, I'm looking forward to you sharing your insights on how coaches and referees can work together to have better games for the kids. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Oh. Great. Thanks, Lewis. Um, let me give you the quick history. I think I may have done this before when I was on a few weeks ago, but I uh, was raised in Southern California, graduated from high school in the mid 60s. Uh, and at that time there for American kids, there was no soccer. There just wasn't any. Um, you had to be part of an ethnic group, of some kind of club uh, to play soccer. And so I was raised on a ranch in San Bernardino. We had 58 acres. And so I went to Cal Poly and I was a farm management major. Um, but I also ran track. I ran 99 for 100 yards. But in our college, that wasn't fast enough because we had two guys uh, who were 9'6 and 9'7. So the coach came and said, well, you can't run sprints anymore. You have to run the quarter mile. Anybody who's done track knows that the quarter mile is a very, very different animal than sprints. You actually have to train. And so that training has to start in the fall. And so it is repeat 220s, repeat 330s. It's just, as the English would say in soccer, donkey work. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's not fun at all. And so I got the bright idea one day that I would enroll in soccer classes uh, and play three days a week, uh, two hours back to back. Um, and that would be a way to shape uh, for soccer. And so at 19 years of age, I had never touched a soccer ball. I had never seen a soccer game. Uh, there was a field down in San Bernardino that I had driven past, but I'd never actually seen anybody play. Uh, and so I started out playing soccer in the PE classes and basically chasing the ball around the field like a dog after a Frisbee or after a tennis ball. And, and, and it was actually great fitness wise. And after a few weeks of it, an Englishman came up to me and said, you know, you're really no good. You stink, but we need Americans on our club team, somebody to front us so we can get money from the school. So that's how I got into soccer and then played a couple of years on the club team and then moved to Santa Maria and played um, in, on, on Mexican teams there. Um, and then eventually in Santa Barbara, I moved to Ojai and was in private schools. Carpinteria, I was the director of the boys club there. And then in 1972, took one of the first USSF soccer classes, uh, courses, got a C, national C license in 72 coached at UCSB and then was national director of coaching for AYSO for seven years and then did my soccer camp for 40 years. So that was basically it. Um, that's how I backed into soccer, totally unknowing about soccer, knowing anything about it. Uh, and it became a livelihood for me for 40 years. And after 40 years, I sold the camp to Nike. And so now I'm happily retired in, in uh, Santa Barbara. And uh, that's the story. But it was interesting. We were talking earlier before this all started about how people, some people are gravitate to referees. Some gravitate toward coaching. I am sure that most of you have also coached. Is that true? 
Yes. Yeah. No, we have the one holdout. All right, Chris. All right, I like it. All right, so part of what you're going to say, you're, I'm going to say probably you will relate to. Others you may not because you haven't coached uh, like at the professionally at the NCAA Division One level. That none of you have coached for 50 years. So let me start out this way. The relationship between coaches and referees is at best strained and at worst hideous. But let's go back to the very beginning of soccer as we know it. When the game first started, players called their own fouls. Right? That's the way that it, it worked out. And when that didn't work out, they found themselves trying to find, okay, how do we resolve this problem? I say it's a foul. You didn't say it's a foul. How do we resolve this problem? And so they asked on the sideline, who, what do you think happened? In other words, they referred the play to that person. And that's how we got, of course, the name referee, somebody who was referred to. And if you see the early pictures of referees, they were in these nice blazers standing on the sideline. And that's how we, we, we went from there, right? So it was referred to somebody off the field who became a referee. Now, in going with your topic, did that seem like a good idea? Yes, I think it was. And the most important part of that, and something that you may not have thought about, right? Even the players realized that they couldn't have a game without some kind of official. It just wasn't going to work if you called your own fouls. Just wasn't going to happen. All right. So the early referees, that's where it happened. So the thing is, referees, it was as if referees came into the game, right, um, unwanted, unannounced, uninvited. You were invited, right? And it was the players that did it because coaches then really weren't existent. That was somebody that filled out the lineup sheet, put it out there, and I'll know that it wasn't until the late 50s that the English national team did not have a full-time head coach, right? Or as they called it, manager, all right? So you got, you were involved, right? You, it was the players that invited you into this thing. Now, as a coach, let's take a look. I mean, we talked earlier a little bit before this happened about how the, the job descriptions of coach and referee are very different. I think they're both challenging, I think to do it well, you have to, to put a great different, a, a great deal of effort and a great deal of thought into it to do both of them well. Very different. Now, all right. Now, I'm a coach. AYSO, you know I'm a coach because I have the hat that says coach on it. I have the clue that says coach on it. And of course, I have a shirt that says coach on it. Right. So that if anybody had any doubts about what my function was, oh, and I have to have a shirt that matches the color of the jerseys of my team. Right. Have to have that. So everybody knows that I'm a coach. And so that gives me kind of the center of attention. Now, later on, the referees become the center of attention because they control the game. But for me, I am the center of this universe of my little team. It is five roles or whether it is U16s or U14s, like a, that I, I was with yesterday afternoon, or college, or pros, or whatever. But of course, the thing is, is that I'm not a coach, right? You know, NFL, NHL, NBA, those are coaches. Greg Popovich, you know, is a coach, right? Bill Belichick is a coach. Just play at it. I pretend to be. And all this stuff on me helps me identify that everybody knows that I'm a coach, right? So think about this for a minute, all right? So I have the clipboard. I have the shirt. I have all that stuff. Now, I'm the head coach, and I am ready for the opening of the season. The first thing that I've done, right, is I've taken all the required AYSO coaching courses. I have sat through those better or for worse. If you had Andy, it was good. If you had me, well, maybe not so much. 
right? But you've had, you've taken the coaching courses, right? I've sat through all of those that I needed to take. And maybe if I'm really serious, I've taken more. All right. Then I have, you know, worked on my soccer strategies. I know if we're going to play high pressure. I know if we're going to play back. I have worked all of this stuff out. And then I've also worked on fabulous dead ball situations, our throwings, our free kicks, right? Our corners, all of that stuff I have worked on and spent time on diagramming it all out. I have worked this stuff until I absolutely know this stuff. And of course, I am who I am. I mine are better than anybody else's. Just right. Oh, amazing corner kick play. All right. Then, right, if there was a draft, oh, I was the draft king. I drafted the best, best, best players possible. My, I know that I, I had to go in order, but my, I know that I'm smarter than everybody else that was on there. And then my preseason program of my practices and laying it out and all of that would rival something in the, in the English Premier League. We're going to do Tuesday. We're going to work on this. Wednesday, we're going to work on that. Next Tuesday, this. I mean, I have time. I am. I have done it. All right. Then, right, my system of play is unique. I'm playing three four three with two center backs. Or I mean, I have worked this stuff, and I have man, it is amazing. Nobody else has a system of play, and whether I have used and picked the players to fit the system or looked at my player or my, my system and, and pick players for them. Was that right? Did I do that right? Players to the system or I pick system to the players. Either one of those two ways. Just do it both ways. Whatever it is, I'm the best. No question about it. All right. Then right arts training sessions. I have laid out the training sessions. I mean I had these laid out a month ahead of time. Right. So this, we're going to do this day, we're going to do that that day, we're going to do, I mean, it is impeccable in what I have done. All right. Now, the other thing that I've done is I have worked very hard on the psychology of my team. My players love me. My players would run off a cliff for me, stick their heads under a truck tire as it's rolling over. They would do anything for me that I wanted to have done. Right. I have worked this, that my players will fall anywhere. Do I said, all right, I have scouted the opposition. I know exactly what they're going to do, who they have, what they're going to do. I have followed through on that. All right. And my fitness level. Oh, I didn't mention my fitness level. I, we have we have worked this out. I've taken pulses. I have looked at this. I've looked at respiration. We have done beep tests. We have done every kind of thing, the, the modern kind of thing. Right now, it's AYSO, so we don't have the little uh, heart rate monitors and the GPS yet. But if that was available to AYSO, I would have done that already so that we would have measured exactly how many yards we would have gone in what period of time, what the pulse was, and what the recovery rates. I mean, I would have done all of that. All right. So here we go. Nothing can stop me from the glory and the adulation which I deserve for doing all of this. All right. All of this preposition, all of these things that I listed, can anybody tell me what the word in all of those were? Discipline. I, I did this, I did that, I whatever, all right? And that's the problem because now, right, I, like all coaches, have this huge ego. I have pulled this team together. I have done all of this, right? It is absolutely, you know, fabulous what I have done with this team, all right? So I plotted and schemed. I've worked so hard to send my team out on the field for their first game. We're ready for the first game, all right? Now, the problem here is that the team is not just a collection of children, right? They represent my best effort and my ego. 
Basically, they represent what I am. They represent me for better or for worse. That's what they've done. All right. Now, part of the problem is that too many coaches, right, believe that team performance reflects on them. That if the team plays well, look, I'm wonderful, I'm great. If the team doesn't, then it reflects on me, right? And of course, because I have this huge coach ego, I don't, it's, it's not my problem. I got them ready. Somehow they have failed me. And this is where you get the very negative, negative coaching that we certainly don't want to see anywhere as far as AYSO. So the thing is, is the coaches, right? So it's interesting. When I went out and did all of the advanced coaching courses all over the country, I would ask coaches how they were doing. How's your team doing? Right. And they would say, oh, we're six and three or we're three and six. They always give me their one loss record. As if that's how their team was doing. And for I think the vast majority of coaches that they judge it. My team does well because of my one loss record. But I would like to think of it in a different terms. And maybe it's because I have been um, involved so long that I can maybe take a, a more sane, a, a little bit different look. Uh, Lewis, can you put up the graphic? There it is. Can everybody read this for a minute? Your child's success or lack of success in sports does not indicate what kind of parent you are. Having an athlete that is coachable, respectful, a great teammate, mentally tough, resilient, and tries their best is a direct reflection of your parent. Everybody got it? Yes? Okay. We're going to pull it down then. There we go. Now, can I, will everybody agree with that? And it's an interesting kind of thing that I would think that about 10 years ago, in my, just my observation, somehow parents were more invested in the ability, their, their kid's ability on the field. That if your eight-year-old wasn't center forward, uh, then you had somehow failed. I think that we've kind of turned a corner on that a bit. Um, that parents are not as invested in their child's success, particularly in AYSO, as they have been. Uh, but it's something we have to be aware of. Now, I asked Lewis to put that graphic up, and it was directed at parents. But can I also do the same thing for coaches? I think so. I think so. I think that our egos as coaches get involved so much that we lose sight of what it is that we're we're trying to do and that that one lost record um makes us lose grasp of what it is that, that our real goals are as far as educating kids and whatever and let me give you an example from my college career uh, my last year at ucsb we wound up 16 and 3 and with only two tuitions not full rides, and playing against teams with 11 full rides, like UCLA, Santa Clara, University of San Francisco, right? We wound up 16 and three with two tuitions and UC admissions requirements, which was by any matter, it, it was a great season. But we lost an early game and then went on a winning streak of like 10 games in a row. And then came down, and I think we lost at San Diego State, and I think we lost at Fullerton. And so now we had three games left against UCLA, Santa Clara, and I forgot who the third team was. And, but, and, but the problem was that we as a team were now thinking in terms of making the NCAA playoffs, something that UC Santa Barbara had never done. And so we, we lost sight of what it was. And all of a sudden I had the, the insight and got the guys together and I said, guys, what was it when we won the 10 straight games? Well, how did we play? And the answer was, well, we marked up tight in the back. We moved the ball through the midfield quickly. And when we had chances, we took them. 
And I said, okay, we got UCLA coming up right on Saturday. Forget winning and losing. Let's play that way. Let's play the way that we should play. And as a result, we won that game. We won at Santa Clara, and I forgot what the other game was that we won. And we went on right to a 16-3 and three season. My point here is that our, our, our maybe part of our problem is one lost record, is that we think too much about whether we win the game or lose the game as opposed to how we play and what and what the result is. And you remember the time when I was coaching at Laguna Blanca, which is a small private school in Santa Barbara, only 60 kids in the whole school, half of which were girls, 20 of whom were on my soccer team, and five of whom had never played soccer in their life before, but thought it would look good on their application to Harvard, Yale, and Northeastern if they had varsity soccer on it. Um, and so I took over for a young lady who had been a player at UCSB, and we played our first game, which was a tournament, and we played at, in, in Santa Barbara, and we played against a team two divisions above us, because Laguna Blanca, with only 60 high school students, was obviously in division Q, R, S, whatever, you know, if they go to ABs, whatever it was, division 27, whatever, whatever it was, we were way at the bottom. And we wound up losing that, and the, the team was two divisions above us, and they had played in the CIS semifinal the year before. And the lady who had coached before me was a yeller and screamer. And so we lost that game, I think it was three to two, and the girls came off nearly in tears asking, are you going to yell at us? Are you going to scream at us? And I said, girls, did you play hard? Yes. Did you play as well as you could? Yes. I've got no problems, right? We're going to take what, the things that we need to do better, right? When we start the league season, and we're going to do well. So we wound up winning the Condor League. And, and going to the CIF, I think, semifinals later on. Um, but I think it's things like that um, that make you understand that how artificial wins and losses are. And I think that as coaches, I mean, as referees, I'm not sure we're in a position, you're in a position where you can change that perception. But I think that, you know, it's something to, to keep in mind, right? So at any rate, Right. The interesting thing from that standpoint is that as a coach over 50 years and coaching everything from, you know, in camp five year olds up through NCAA Division One, I had years when I was 16 and three in Division One, and then I coached a high school team that, that, that was 14 and 0. And yet that wasn't the best year that I coached. The best year that I coached was a high school varsity team. I moved up to a high school varsity team in Ohio, a private school that had not won a league game in five years. And that first year, we lost all of our games, but tied two. But we never lost by more than one goal. And what was funny was that the people, the administrators in the school, right? I had been, had coached the junior high and been very successful, sixteen and, or fourteen and zero the year before. And they were wondering what happened. How? What did you forget? Why can't you coach anymore? You lost all but two of your games. And yet I knew as a coach that I had that was the best job that I would ever do right? As far as taking what I had, and because co teams have a range, they, the best they can play, and the least that they can play, and your job is to take them and push them over toward the best that they can play model, all right? So, you know, um, that was the best year. So, here we come now to the referee coach thing. I have done all these things that I listed, and I was so good at doing them all, and now I send my team out on the field, right? And the faith, my ego, my everything is wrapped up and put into the hands of three people that I may not even know. They hold the key to my success or my failure and my ego and the hands. So that's the dilemma that coaches face. But they have done all this work. They know they have been brilliant. And now, right, things are totally left to chance because referees can completely out, can, can affect the outcome of the game. Now, let me say this. As a coach, as two-year referee, but as an observation of the game for 50 years, I can count three or four games where referees change the outcome of a game. 
right? Doesn't happen very often, right? It has to be a last minute pain. It has to be a sending off early on. It has to be something like that. And when we've had teams that I've had, I've had doubts about the, the officials, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. I said, look, you do not want to leave this in the hands of officials. You 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 got to play as well as you can so that you get the result that you want and the re- and, and play the referees out of it so that it is not something that the referees you know is left. With. We want to be two or three goals up when this thing ends to, to make it safe to to play it. And coaches talk in those kinds of terms, right? Take it out of the hands of the officials, right? We don't want to do that. So to put it bluntly, you send your team out and you hope they're not going to get screwed. That's basically what you're hoping, right? So now, all right, I really believe in positive coaching. I believe in balanced teams. I believe in good sportsmanship. But I want every tactical advantage as a coach that I can get. All right? For example, a small thing, Andy's heard this before in the advance, was as my team warms up on their half of the field, I position myself so that I can watch my team, but I'm not really watching my team. I'm watching the opposition. And having been around and played and coached for as long as I can, I can spot the players on the other team in 30 seconds. Their touches, their vision, right, how they move. I know who the players are. Even if I've never seen this team before, I can do that. All right, I want that advantage. Now, it, it, to, to, to show you how far you can take this, everybody familiar with Liverpool and, and, and Jurgen Klopp, right? Klopp, before his games, stands on the half line and looks only at the other team, arms folded. Every move, every warm up that they make, because he wants to see any injuries, who's moving well, right? And I suspect for Klopp, too, there's a matter of intimidation as well. What's he doing? Who's he looking at? Whatever. I I was never quite that callous that I would just stand on the half line and watch the other team. Right. Uh, I wanted to be with my team in the vicinity of my team as they got warmed up as a kind of a a, a bonding thing and be there with them as you guys are getting warm and, and whatever. Right. But I would do that. All right. The other thing that I would do is I would go and talk to the officials first. Right. The, the, and the, I would introduce myself on an hi, I'm Alan and you are and get their names. And I would get their names. Right. So that it was Lewis and Cindy. Right. And Matt. Right. I would, hi, Matt. How are you? Whatever, whatever. And then I would ask the question, is there any particular points of emphasis that you're working on? Right. Is there any thing that, that it's really, you know, come down, right, that we need to be aware of. And, 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 and part of that was then to get them some communication with me to kind of see where they were on it, whether there was, um, and in some cases, language, that some of the referees that we would have could barely speak any English. Okay, then I've got to be aware of that as well. So as a, as a tactician, I'm doing it. I am going out. I am talking to it. The other thing is, is that by going out, being friendly and whatever, I'm hoping to build up some kind of rapport with them. Um, and so that, you know, at least um, I will, my, 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 I will, it'll, it'll come out, I'll, I'll come out even on the breaks. Always hoping for that kind of thing. All right. To get a read on, on kind of what they are. I'm also looking at badges. Right. What level of certification? If I'm playing club, I want to see what level that 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 referee is. Um, you know, I, I, I want to know that kind of what I'm dealing with here and that that kind of thing. So before the game, I, that's what I'm doing. I'm going out and talking to the referees. So let me break for a second here. Now, how many of you actually have coaches come out and talk to you like that? I do. Chris, they come back to you. Sometimes, uh, but not very often. Andy? Uh, 
King Kong Monster for the first time you know, last this past uh, spring, well, sp you know, winter. I had some that was, and I was the, an AR. I think Cindy was the referee, but he was trying to, he was actually tr not doing what you were doing. He was trying to work me a little bit. Yeah, we're going to talk about that later. <laughs> Cindy? Uh, I would say maybe about 10% of them at, at most. Most of them um, just kind of want to avoid the, the referee. And, and really? Or they're just so involved with their team that they don't even think about doing that. Wow, I'm really surprised. Because it always seemed to me from the get-go, I want to know these people. I want to have them. I want to ha If I can get some kind of personal relationship with them, I, I've always felt that that's, you know, to my advantage. I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't do that. And, and it's one of the things that I mentioned uh, before when I was on a, a few weeks ago, I, as a coach and the one who was actually paid to win games, I never felt that there was a conflict between respecting referees and winning games. I just never thought that that was, that was never a, um, there was any conflict between that. All right. So now, if you go, if you talk with coaches and I've done this and Andy's been there for the advanced course and we talk about referees, I do, it's not in the syllabus at all for the advanced course. And that's probably why they're not letting me do them anymore. Right. Uh, well, yes, they would, but, um, I, and we talk about referees. And so I go to the referees and I say, look, if you're ethical and you're not trying to cheat your way to a win or whatever, aren't there really only two things that you want from referees, right? One is that the laws are applied accurately. And I say, coaches, can you go with that? And every hand will go up. Yeah, I want the, applaud, the, the laws to apply accurately. All right, now, here's the problem, is that those of you who have refereed for a while know that Every game situation is different. And the laws, I think, have to be applied differently in each, for each situation that you're in. And let me see if I can give you some examples, right? Um, we had a referee in Santa Barbara. His name was Carl. Andy may know way back who I'm talking about, but I'm not going to say a last name. And Carl came up through AYSO and loved refereeing. He, I mean, he loved refereeing and then went on and got up and went and did high school and then went and did uh, some club games. And when I was coached at USCSB in the late 70s, he, he found out that there was ASL, the old American Soccer League, ASL, in San Fernando Valley called, called the LA Skyhawks, played in the old ASL and that the coach was a friend of mine. And so he asked in his preseason, could he come up and could we play a game at Dwight Murphy um, and do a scrimmage? And Carl had heard about this scrimmage that was going on. And so he called me and said, hey, Alan, I heard you're having this scrimmage. Could you let me referee? And so I had no money at that age for spring scrimmages, referees or anything like that. We had no budget. Right. And so I said, sure, Carl, no problem. Just don't wear your AYSO patch because that'll kind of be a dead tip off. Right. So he said, great. So I got He rounded up a couple of people the line. And so we played this game and the game was going on and had through the opening. A ball came down between two players. Two feet went up. Very high feet. And. The, the, the player, the pro player for the Skyhawk, caught the ball on his foot and in one turn pirouetted around 180 degrees and was off headed toward our goal. Carl, being the good AYSO referee that he was, right, recognized two feet up high and blew the whistle. The professional player world looked at him and said, what the FFF, right, were you doing? Right. And Carl said, high foot. Right. So 
my point is here is that if he were doing a what was in Division Five AYSO game, which was ten year olds, that would have been the perfect call. No question about it. Two feet, studs showing, right foul, right. In this case, right, it wasn't, right. It was not the case, right. In 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 this case, and, it, and so he learned that the application of the laws vary depending on the level of the play that you have. In the same sort of situation about Laguna Blanca before, right, we were playing a CIS semifinal down at Windward, which was in Santa Monica private school, won the division six championship the year before. And we had had, had problems that year, especially with referees. Uh, we felt that especially with uh, referees who were Hispanic, when we played down at Channel Islands or we played at Santa Paula, that we did not get the calls. There, it wasn't, wasn't a, a, a fair job. And so when we come out to win and we're getting warmed up, out come a trio of referees, right, all Hispanic. And my girls go, oh, no, here we go again. Right, we we'll mail this game in. There's no way. Right, we're going to get five penalties called against us. We're going to. We are dead. We're absolutely sunk. Right, isn't going to happen. Well, the good news was, was that the center ref was a guy, Baldomero Toledo. Any him? Lewis, you know who that is? Anybody else? Yeah, I heard the name once or twice. Yeah, FIFA referee has done MLS games for 10 years, right? Has done, you know, World Cup qualifying games. <laughs> and the good news was, I knew who he was, right? And I said, girls, the last thing you have to worry about in this game is the referee crew. Because obviously, he picked his buddies to do this, right? And I don't know who the buddies were. I've got to tell you, that from a playoff game, that was the best game I'd ever seen. Now, the reason I'm coming to this was that he allowed the girls to play. He did not complain over dom he did not dominate the game. He was there if there was a foul, right? I mean, he tried to let the girls play because it was a it was a CIF semifinal game. He wanted the girls to, to play the game. And it was it, it was wonderful. It was just a great game that he did. We wound up losing the second overtime, the last minute of the second overtime. Uh, we gave up a goal, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, and didn't get to the middle. But as we were getting the girls together and whatever and, and wiping off tears, right, which is what happened at that stage because they had all had to winning this CIF championship, the only time that, that, that the school had ever actually gotten that far. But they were, they were you know, counting on winning and we hit the post two or three times we should have won but it was one of those as they were wiping the tears off he walked by and kind of looked at me and I just said impeccable right it was excellent a great game. and he had called the, a, a game at the level that we needed all right uh other times right you get situations um here's an, I'll throw another name out Toros Cabritzian anybody know that name form of former FIFA referee who did our college games. And again, it was refereed at a level that was commensurate with the college, right? It was, I mean, you had to really get knocked down before through the whistle, right? I mean, he gave advantage, he tried to give advantage every way that he could. So that this whole thing about the laws being applied accurately for, I think the average AYSO coach they, they, it's a very linear kind of thing. Here's the law. You call it this way, and, and that's the way it should be for their age group. But those of us who have been around a bit longer understand that you call games differently depending upon the skill level, the age, and the ability of the, the teams, you know, that's involved. All right? So now, the other half of it, when I go to the advanced courses, is that I talk about the laws being applied consistently. 
and I, in the course, I say, okay, the, the, the foul that's the foul in the first quarter is also the foul that's in the fourth quarter, right? The foul against my team is the same game against your team, your game. And I put my, I say, how many people want that too? Laws applied consistently. Yes, every hand goes up. Yes, that's what we want. But again, right, it is, that's impossible. You can't be absolutely consistent, I don't think, referees, in your calls because you've got, right, the flow versus control. There are times when a game's starting to get out of hand, when you have to sit on things harder, right, than you would. There are times when you're going to have to give a yellow card when you might not have before. But coaches, they think, oh, I just want to consistent. I want the same fouls for their team that I get for mine, I want the games early, right? They think it, to me, they think it at a very primitive, is that a good word? I'm not sure. <laughs> a very, you know, what? everybody know what I'm saying, please <laughs> help me out here, right? They, they a very rudimentary Maybe level. simplistic. Simplistic, simplistic. Level. Thank you. That's exactly the word. They wanted it at a simplistic level, somewhere where they could, you know, um, it makes sense to them in the context of what they're coaching. But basically, you know, that's what coaches want. Coaches want at the, the, the laws, you know, the, the called accurately and then consistently. And 99% and, and of the coaches in the advanced courses um, will, will, will subscribe to that. Now, whether they do that, right, is um, another thing. In the practical running of the kind of thing, you have, because of human psychology and fools and whatever, you have all kinds of different things that come in. And let me talk for a minute about even up calls. Everybody know what I'm talking about? Yes? <laughs> okay. Now, referees, some people say, don't exist. There is no such thing as an even up call. I remember years ago, uh, it was in the evening, I'm sitting there and I'm watching a Mexican game. Chivas are playing against America and El Clasico in Mexico. This is the big game in Mexico. Chivas of Guadalajara against America. And at the end of the first half, one of the Chivas strikers goes to the edge of the box. He's inside the box. And as the ball comes into his feet, the America player grabs his shirt and pulls him down and the referee, very rightly, after consulting with the AR, right, points to the penalty spot. It is a penalty. All right? Chivas, go ahead. one nothing. And I say to my wife at the time, I said, watch. There will be a penalty in the second half. And sure enough, right, there was. America got a penalty in their favor the second half. Now, it was not blind luck that I said that. And over all the years, I have seen the even up calls, and I always wondered why there, why that was the case. And I brought this up at a advanced course in South Orange County years ago. And a guy said, can I be on this for a minute? And I said, yes, absolutely. He said, I am a basketball referee. I do NCAA Division I games. So obviously, the guy had gotten to a point where he was pretty reasonable. And he said, let me tell you what happens with even up calls. And I said, Just tell me. I I'm, I'm all ear, right? And he's here's the situation. You call like a technical foul. You call, you know, uh, goaltending in basketball. And he said, then you go the rest of the game, making sure that if that situation happens again, you call it. That you don't give the coaches on either. Well, you call it there and you call it, you didn't call it. That comes back and see thing again, right? He says, it isn't that referees try to even things up. It's that they're now maybe more aware. Now, can I stop for a minute and get your guys' opinion on his, his thoughts on that? So I like it. Um, when, uh, when you were saying that when you, your first call, you're really talking about a consistency, right? So once you yeah. realize what level that foul was or that challenge, um, if, you, if you set the bar at that and call that very, very consistently, you know, that, that's as best as you can do, right? 
Yeah. Uh, Alan, this is Matt. You know, very interesting that you brought that up because if you if you think I watch basketball too, and so yesterday in one of the, the championship games, so the playoff games, there was a controversy, three point foul called um, in the last like seconds, and the ref then made an additional call for the other team as time expired, and it ended up changing the course of the uh, of the of the game, and and the team ended up shooting free throws with nobody else you know, um, under the basket and they, they ended up winning. But um, it really shows that that referee made that decision and stuck to it and then had to make that same observation on the additional following play and then called it. And it became controversial because they hadn't been calling that during the whole game. So being inconsistent and then making those calls and they can really shine light on controversy in a match, especially in, in soccer where the goals are fewer. Yeah, no, it, it, obviously a call like a penalty call um, it absolutely impacts a game where one foul called in, a, in an NBA game is negligible. Anybody on this even up calls? I'm, I'm all ears on this. I'm Dumbo. I want to hear anybody else's thoughts on it. Yeah, I, you see it happen in different ways, right? I mean, the, the ugliest way is when you see a, an offense fabricated referees. I got it. Okay, I called one that way, or I got one wrong over there. Yeah, you know, that coach is on me. I need to. Coach has asked me to call both ways. I got to get one for that side. Um, but yeah, that's different from what that that basketball referee mentioned, where if if you call something that may be controversial, may be difficult, uh, he was making sure he called it if it happened again. You know, that's that's a different thing. He mentioned, uh, you know, that his, the the coaches wouldn't let it go if he were to miss it. So it's partially managing and getting like that. So I think, yeah, there's a, there's a fine line to balance it. We're all here to be fair. Um, sometimes it can be hard to be fair. I've, I've been in those games where it's, you know, you get to, you, you're getting 40 minutes in and it's 15 fouls on one side and two fouls on the other. And how do you yeah. rectify that? And those are yeah, tough games to handle. Here, huh? Where one team is consistently fouling, you know, yeah, what a nightmare. All right, let me go on because uh, uh, Lewis, tell me now, we're running up on, uh, come up close to eight. Uh, my guess, I've got about another 10, 15 minutes. Uh, do you want me to continue on or do part two or? I, I'm getting thumbs up from the crowd. They, they want more. Okay, cool. All right. All right, so given the fact there are even up calls, right? Um, your worst, you, you, what you fear as a coach, and you tell them it is at halftime, if a penalty kick has been awarded to the other team in the half, you are telling the team, hey, don't sneeze, don't touch, breathe on anybody near the penalty box, in, the, in, in, in our penalty box, during the second half. And to me, that's just good coaching, right? I mean, I would like to think that even up calls don't exist, but they do, I'm sorry. The other one, the red card. If the other team has been issued a red card, then I am scared for my team that now an even up call is going to happen. So I'm talking, when we talk about, I mean, that I've ever coached for 50 years, We've talked about it. The other team gets a red card. Now you're going to make sure that you do. we have this advantage. We do not want to throw this advantage away, right, of that being the, the player up, right? So you've got to be extra careful about your tackles and red, or you have to actually let somebody go. You're going to let them go uh, where I, what might be a yellow card now turns into a red card because of an up call. So that's, you know, you're, you are um, – He's concerned about that um, as from the coach's standpoint when dealing with the referees. Now, the other thing as a coach that is your absolute worst nightmare is when you have an incompetent referee or one that may be incompetent. That may not be a fair insecure referee, right? Who is 
or who, who, who lacks training, lacks a temperament, whatever, and is insecure. You put those two things together, a lack of ability and insecurity, and as a coach, that is your worst bear. Absolutely worst. Because they probably don't have to control the game. Right? They, they don't have the ability to control the players. So they're going to be absolutely rabbit ears on any comments from the sideline, any comments from the players, and to show that they have control, then they're going to overdo cards or fouls or whatever it is. And so as a coach, that was always the thing that I was concerned. And that was part of the reason that I would go out and have, to, you know, at the beginning of the game and talk to referees and see kind of where they were at and, 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 try to judge and plumb a sense of confidence from them where they were and that kind of thing um, because you you just it's really a tough situation again back at Laguna we had a situation where we had two very young referees doing a girls varsity high school game back then it was two referee system and for the first half there was the guy, there was a, a girl and a guy, and the girl did, did really well, but the guy in a half of the game made no calls, none. No offsides, no um, fouls, nothing, even though there were times when there certainly, I mean, as you can imagine, any high school in a half, one end of the field, there's going to be situations. So at the halftime, I go out and look, um, I'm really concerned about this because you're not making any calls and I'm not trying to gain an advantage here. Please understand, but please call something because it's going to deteriorate because you, you all know what happens, right? When referees don't step in and um, players are left to their own advantage. Now this is a private school league for God's sake. <laughs> Hatchet league where <laughs> you had people out, you know, trying to hurt. Sure enough, 10 minutes into the, into the game, um, you, we had a girl that slid tackle from behind and her ankle got broken because at that end of the field, nothing had been called before. So the players, and of course at college level, players know, and Lewis, if you coach you referee college, you know this, they will do the first tackle really hard and they're going to see what you're going to do. You don't do anything, well, the next tackle comes in hard, right? And they will plumb up to where you know, wherever that level of distance is uh, and go from there. So in this case, I had to carry this girl off. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, what do I say at this stage, right? Or, or, I, I mean, I, I, I did, I would do from, a, from an ethical coach's standpoint to go and say and express my concerns, right? Um, referees, can you help me? Is there anything that I, I mean, I certainly wrote up a report afterwards uh, on that particular official, coaches or referees, what do I do? Help. I, I would recommend going to the referee who is calling fouls and showing confidence and kind of do it separate from the other referees so they don't feel like you're criticizing them because they're already insecure yes. and have a you know, a little conversation with them, say, hey, can you help this guy out? I'm a little concerned about it. Um, can you see if you could help us out? I think I would feel that would be the most productive thing for a coach yeah. to do. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, it seems like a tough situation. <laughs> yeah. So, Alan, yeah. that's a tough one for me, too. I was uh, thinking back on my coaching days and, and a lot of times when I spoke up to referees, I would still introduce myself and everything, but I was the type of uh, coach where I didn't talk very, very much during the game. It was just very much positive encouragement to my players, maybe a little bit of strategy, but mostly it was very quiet. The times that I would talk to the referees when I was, is when I was concerned about the safety of my players because the, the, the consistency of the game, either I couldn't, it was, uh, it was getting too rough and mm -hmm. um and safety was judgment right and so that's when i would start raising my voice talking to the first the closest referee which the line you know the lines person right 
And then yeah. during halftime, we would just we would just talk about, hey, hey, um, uh, would you guys comment on the the level of intensity of the game with respect to the safety of players? And we just had a quick conversation on that. Um, mm -hmm. you, you pose a good point that if you have two referees that are um, uncomfortable at that level uh, and one's more, you know, with, with one more experience, the question is, is that more experienced one, will that person step up, right? You just don't know. It's, a, it's kind of a wild card and you have to do as best you can as a coach to at least raise the awareness that, hey, we have a safety risk here for the players right. and we're not reading the level of play correctly from the standpoint of emphasizing state safety of the game. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. Uh, was that uh, in the early days of CIF soccer, um, it was a tactic that if your team was getting uh, kind of beat up in the game, and especially if you were ahead, uh, that you pull your team off for your team safety. Uh, the CIF stepped in and passed a rule, made a law that if you did that, then the school had to fire that coach. Uh, you couldn't use that as a tactic. Kind of funny. I don't know if that rule is still in, in force or not at one point. If you pulled your team off in that situation, like if I pulled my team off at that point, then I could no longer be the coach of that team. So it's, it's funny. Does anyone know anything about that? Yeah, I don't think I've heard anything specific about that. I don't think it's not in the laws of the game. It's in the administrative kind of end of it. But at any rate, let me go on here because we're running we're running a little course. Uh, can I talk a little bit about practical use of the laws and how coaches try to use the tactics? For example, uh, a friend of mine was the coach down at Irvine, or not, he was at Laverne, uh, University of Laverne. Uh, and they, of course, played in the Division Three. And his team in Laverne, for those of you who are, are familiar with SAC and, and, and the Division Threes, they never won anything. They never did anything. But one year he had a very good team together that he had put together. And they were playing against, um, uh, which, who was it? They were um, not Laverne. They were Laverne. Uh, Claremont College and Claremont College the year before had won the Division Three National Championship, and so Dave, my friend, uh, had about ten minutes left, and he actually was on a one nothing lead against um, uh, the the school against the team, and they had they had won um, the the Division Three the year before, and if Laverne hung on to this win, the first time in the school's history would get into the CA playoffs and it would have been a huge accomplishment for him as a coach uh getting him to move up uh into the coaching ranks into division two or division three or whatever it was very good and and they were knowing that they needed to win that play and 10 minutes left goldstein gets a brilliant idea and he calls uh he uh calls over his center forward and he goes to the center forward and he says go up and stand with the goalkeeper on the other team and the kid looks at him and says what he says yeah go stand with a goalkeeper on the other the other team and then he deals out to his, his his defenders whenever you get the ball hit it as far as you can so the ball now gets hit down to the far end of the field referee the linesman waves the flag referee calls offside right Back where the ball get placed? Spot where the player was side. So now the ball goes away. It's down there. He can now push his team forward, give him a break, and they play that way for the last ten minutes. All right. So interesting idea of how to use things, how to use it. Now I was concerned when I heard this, and I said, "Wait a minute! Doesn't that count as persistent infringement?" Isn't that unsportsmanlike or un something, right? And so it happened that a couple of weeks later, I happened to be able sitting with the MLS head law interpreter and I gave him this scenario and he said, everybody can stand wherever they want. That is perfectly within the laws of the game. And I just thought that that was a really brilliant use of the laws um, as they were written then. Um, 
for the game. Now, referees tell me now, has that changed? Or is it where the last defender is? Is that where the ball is placed now? Law test time. Who's got the answer? The current answer. We got a couple of national referees and national candidates here. Come on, guys. Help. Alex. Trending you on the spot. I'm being quiet because I know the answer, and we talked about the differences between then and now. So I'm not going to comment. <laughs> okay, I'll. What was the ahead. question? <laughs> The ball is placed. Well, referees get back, back when this took place, a number of law changes ago, he had the he had the attacking player stand at the goal line uh, on the attacking side. And then he would have them play the ball over the top. And then at the law at that time, I'm kind of giving it away. It was at the position of where that player was. It didn't matter whether the ball got to him or anything else. So therefore, the ball was now being moved all the way down to the other side, all the way to the farthest point away from the goal that they didn't want to be scored upon. And they'd have to work their way back up. So I probably gave away too much, but it's not citing the actual current law. So what's the current law? Matt, Chris? First thing I would think is the player can stand wherever he wants as long as he's not participating. Then there's no offside. Right. If he's participating, then the infringement is where the offside took place. Right. So, no, the player would go participate. If the ball was played out wide, he would run and he'd go to play it. He wanted to participate. All right. So I would say where he becomes or she becomes involved in active play. And that's the critical shift that happened not too long ago. So it's right here in the first sentence of offenses and sanctions. Let me zoom in a bit for y'all here. Is that more legible? So if an offside cookies, uh, if an offside offense occurs, the referee awards an indirect free kick where the offense occurred including if it is in the player's own half of the field of play. Now, what does it take for an offside offense? Position. Participation. Yeah. And you're ahead of the uh, second to the last defender or the ball. Uh-huh. And then there's the timing, right? So there's 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 the position, the timing, and then the involvement in active play. So now it's where that last box is checked. So that's why they added that it can occur on the player's own half of the field. While you cannot be in an offside position on your own half of the field, you can complete, you can check the final box for an offside offense on your own half of the field by getting involved at that point. Back when Alan was witnessing this situation, um, the restart position was different. Uh, yeah, uh, I'd never seen a coach cue in on that, but I always thought that was a little bit unfair the way it was written. That's yeah. clever. I mean, I've heard this story for well over 20 years, I believe. And um, so back then, it didn't matter whether the player was actively involved. If the player was in an offside position at the moment that the ball was played, it was called and it was called where it was. And then so there's been, I don't know, probably three or four refinements from 20 years ago. The first one being, being, uh, actually no, I've lost my train of thought, sorry. But the big difference was the active involvement because the player was never actively involved because the ball never reached them. They were calling it immediately as soon as the ball went off because he was in an offside position in the definition of somewhere around 20 years ago. I just thought it was a clever use of tactics though. By... 
see something that nobody else had ever seen before. And I've waited for years to have a chance to use it, but my situation has never come up to do it. Just to see what the reason and, and would do. So let me go on for, and let's talk, can I talk for a few minutes about free kicks? All right, Andy is there in the advanced talk about free kicks and especially defending free kicks is that you never, 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 ever line up your wall 10 yards from the, from the ball. You will always line it up as a coach. You're always going to line it up eight or nine yards. Now, what was interesting was that years ago when I was the director of coaching and what was his name? Brian, the English guy, was the director of officiating for AY, so the national director of officiating. One weekend in Hawthorne at the national office, we had the national coaches and the national referees in the, the same weekend having meetings. And Brian uh, came up with a test for referees. And what you did is he put down a line, gave you a pencil, blew the whistle, and you had to run out and stick the pencil 10 yards from the line. And then what they would do was they would measure how close the pencil was to 10 yards and how fast you got the pencil there. So it was a combination of the two factors, and he had it all worked out. He was an engineer, of course, right? Aren't all referees, right? And so the interesting thing was, I think that there were 10 coaches on the National Coaching Commission. There were 10 referees on the National Referee Commission. And one of the two groups, seven of the top 10 scores were either coaches or referees. Which do you think it was? Coaches. Coaches. It was coaches because all the coaches had played. We knew what 10 yards was, right, and could get there quicker than the referees could. So it was a very interesting thing of this whole thing, out the spacing and that kind of stuff. But as a coach, we had never lined up. Now, now things are, of course, very different now. Does AYSO use this foam as well? No? Good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've never been a big of it. And the funny thing was, was that uh, two nights ago, or three nights ago, two nights ago, I think it was, or no, three nights ago, four nights ago, there was a USL soccer game on TV. Did anybody see it? Orange County was playing against San Diego. Landon Donovan was coaching San Diego. And they had a young lady who was the referee. And you could tell from the body language that this was apparently a for her. She was somewhat nervous about the whole thing. And she actually did a very good job. But at one point, there was a free kick in the last couple of minutes. And she was such a hurry to do it, she got out her foam can and sprayed around the tops of all of the Orange County players' shoes that were lined up in the wall. So that when she backed them up, there was no foam left on the field at all. She was trying to do it so quickly. So I'm thinking, oh, man, I'm so glad to hear that AYSO doesn't do that. Um, but at any rate, um, we always line up at eight yards. And my wh whoever it was was assigned to be the person that did the, built the wall builder, in my terminology is what we call, always lined up eight. And they knew within inches of what eight yards was. Um, and, and, and it was amazing to me. If you did that eight or nine yards, how often you could get away with it. Um, and the referees would kind of look at it and say, close enough, let's get on with the game. Uh, and so from a tactical standpoint, um, we're always doing that kind of thing, uh, you know, to get on with it. The other thing uh, was that the, the absolute creative ways in which you would use to waste time. Now, the big thing was, was that when you coach in the NCAA in, in college, um, which is different from high school, uh, the AYS, the clock is kept on the sideline. And the clock runs until the referee goes like that and you stop the time. So time wasting at the college level was a whole, I mean, it was a work of art. Right, against a game against UCLA, my little midfielder, right, and this was actually uh, 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 Ahmed's brother, Andy. Wow. 
So this is Ahmed Jahadami's brother, right? And he uh, had a throw in with just a couple of minutes left. Taking the throw in, he immediately ran down the sideline, right, where the referee saw him and waved him. Meanwhile, what's happening? Time's going on. All right. So then, right, Ahmed comes back, right, and he um, comes back and he gets the ball and he throws it and throws it, making sure that what? It doesn't cross the sideline. Right? What's happening? Time is going off the clock. <laughs> so finally now, he comes back, and I mentioned the name before, Toros Cabritzia. Toros was a FIFA referee, uh, one of the you know outstanding referees in the history of this country. I think somewhere in Armenia originally, but came here and, and, and coached at the very, a refereed at the very, very highest levels, right? And so, right, Ahmed gets the ball, and, and waits as long as he can wait. And Toros, you can just see, he is, the, the veins are starting to bulge in his forehead. He's getting irritated, right? And he's getting ready to, the whistle is going to his mouth. And, 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 and Ahmed calls the fullback forward and says, here, you take, you take the throw, all right? And so he finally takes the throw. And as the ball's going up the field, Right, Taurus Cabritsian comes by and he looks at me and he says, if that happens again, you're getting a red card. <laughs> I mean, but, uh, but, but everything, the ploy had absolutely, absolutely worked, right, was that we had eaten up a minute, a minute and a half of time with two minutes left. And so you go from there. So I, I'm, I'm just saying that this is something that you're all well aware of. But especially if you get up to the point where you're doing college games, it becomes even more, you know, kind of stuff, um, you know, that you're trying to do as far as a coach. So quickly, let me finish up. I, I've always thought that there was an imbalance and unfairness uh, between coaches and referees. I've always wanted to see, right, when a coach makes a substitution for the referee to run over to the coach and say, you see, what an idiot you are. Number 11 should be out of the wing. Right. But that never happens. I would love to see that happen. But indeed, there was one game in which I saw. Right. It was a club game up in Bakersfield. And this coach, who was just a terrible coach, was on this referee. And he was and we didn't talk about working referees. But maybe that's another time we can talk about ref, working referees and that kind of stuff. But this guy was on the referee for every call, for everything that went on. And this went on 90 minutes. And finally, it got toward the end of the game, and you heard the guy yell out at the referee. And he said, referee, why don't you use your head? And the referee turned at him and smiled. And he said, sir, I really would like to have it off so many times, I can't even find it. That's my final take for That's coaches a good one. against referees. <laughs> at least the referee in one case got his revenge. <laughs> Uh, it's great when the referees have enough wit to pull that off without getting themselves in trouble. It was great. Wow. Well, thank, thank you, you everybody for having me. This was, and hope that it was at least uh, entertaining, if not enjoyable. Certainly, I think I think it goes without saying. Anytime you want to uh, join us again, we'd ha be happy to have you back. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. And it's funny that you mentioned the 10 yards and the referees not being able to get it. In Team 3, we drill that. Um, I think uh, it might not have been our first year. Team 3 just crossed its seventh birthday. Um, and I, I just went to Home Depot and got, got a length of material um, and marked it out to 10 yards. So if we're killing some time or we actually do on-field practice when we're allowed to be within uh, reasonable distances of each other. Um, uh, and we will have people running around the field. There's a ball and then someone blows a whistle, the ball stops and everyone's got to just disperse 10 yards exactly from the ball. And then we bring yeah. this chain over and we measure it out and, and we do that and people start, you can see them tuning it in, tuning it in. So it's, it's funny to hear that, that at the top level, uh, so many of those referees and coaches had a, had a hard time getting to the 10 yards. Well, everybody was reasonably close, 
but I was saying that seven of the top 10 scores were coaches, right? Because mm-hmm. we had dealt with walls and, and physically done walls and, and, and played these games back and forth. And it's so funny. And Andy will do the same thing when he, when he, he coaches, we'll do a lot of grid work. And I would bet you that even at age 76, well, I did it yesterday, actually. Um, you can go out the yard squares, and if you went out and measured them, they would be within six inches of 10 yards because you just get used to doing that. So, mm-hmm. And if it were eight yards, it would have been 10 out of the top 10 were coaches. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Agreed. Uh, that was great. Thanks Thanks for sharing the insight, and I hope, I hope everyone got, got some enjoyment and some knowledge out of that. Um, so, uh, Lewis, let me uh, let me make a comment because yeah. I was just I was just I always like to uh, kind of summarize my mind a couple pieces that just registered with what Alan was saying, and I wanted to share it with you just to see just to kind of get some comments around the you know around the board. Um, so, as as I get more and more experience in refereeing, what I've noticed in the level of games that I do, I I tend to do like U sixteen, U nineteen on AYSO, and I'm very active with CIF. And I realize uh, as, I, as I get more and more experience, reading the game is really critical to me because of that level of players. And I really, and it's a, there's a certain relationship of respect between players, coaches, and, uh, and the referees where we need to learn how to read that game because the kids want to, the, the players want to play at a level that, they, uh, that they're comfortable with, right? And at a very high competition level, they want to. They want to knock it up. That's just what they're used to. Your examples, Alan, um, the college players uh, coming in with a very, very hard challenge. They're used to that, right? They might be uh, uh, registering what is extreme and what is okay, right? Um, with what your example was, but but they they the players like to uh, um, they like to play at that certain game. So reading that is very important. And as and and what you were saying about the two things that coaches wanted most about uh, laws applied accurately laws applied consistently it's uh, what i added to that was reading the game consistently as we're going to the game so understanding what level of players that they want to play and then um and then at applying those laws consistently accurately throughout that game um is just uh it, it just it that that's what registered for me um i uh we had some other team three uh interactions in the last couple of months where we talked about the thinking referee versus the book referee and it's very true that as we get into those higher level games, that we are getting more into that thinking referee zone, where the book referee is good because you need to you need to know the the um, the the reason why laws are put in place. But as a thinking referee, we need to apply them based on the level of players and the level of play that we're we're seeing. So uh, it's just something that registered to me. So I appreciate how you uh, you laid it out tonight from a from a standpoint of a coaching uh, uh, perspective, and then how I internalized it as a referee in terms of how I was playing it with the, the higher game. So thank you. Yeah. And the other thing too, that when you get up to the level that you're talking about high school, how intimidation now becomes a factor for the players. Can I intimidate the other team's good players? And that comes into place. And that's, I mean, that's another whole discussion how that goes on and how you do it, how you recognize it and, and whatever, which is something totally grid as far as application of the rules and consistency. Another whole third part of it is the fact that at some point now you're talking about intimidation and it's, 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 it's practical use. Um, and while I, as a division one coach, never told anybody to go out and kick somebody at the same time, um, when we played Berkeley early season and beat them at our place, and we came toward the end of the season up at their place, their two captains came into the co- into the coach and begged him to reschedule the game on a turf field that was basically con, so that it would take away us sl- doing sliding tackles. When you when, when the captains of the other team go to the coach and say, please, we reschedule this to another field, right, because of Santa Barbara and their defense, you know you're in their head big time. And and that didn't I'm sorry, that didn't bother me at all. That's quite a quite a power to have. That's impressive. 
I have afraid of you. Two quick comments. So, one thing that Alan did when he was a coach, head coach at UCSB, is during the uh, ramp up to the season, all of his players had to take a referee course so they would know the laws of the game. There's a story that can be told some other time if it comes back or whatever. And then the other thing is, is that Alan, I don't, I think only recently he actually was given a card by a referee. Did you finally yes. get, Alan, I think you said something about it. Uh, yeah, I said something to a referee and he took uh, the wrong way. And that's 50 years of coaching. But that out was of all only... those years, and no matter how he's told you how to try and deal with referees and try and take advantage of the laws and everything else, he doesn't speak to the referees. Actually, he doesn't speak to his players. He, he watches them. His stuff is, uh, and he tells the coaches that. You coach, you teach in practice, and then you let them take the test in the game. And that's always one of those, those characteristics I key in on if I, if I want to know what kind of coach I've got um, on that game, the, the yeah, more they let their players play. And that is especially when you watch games at a college or a pro level, and you see coaches who are on the sideline just yapping away and yapping away, right? Um, I'm trying to think of a coach that was, that was a, one of the Mexican coaches, uh, Hugo, God, I've forgotten his last name, national team player uh, for Mexico, uh, leading goal scorer in the Spanish league. Uh, and he was nonstop from the first minute yapping at his players on the sidelines. Now, first of all, put yourself in a player's place. You don't want that, right? But if you're yapping and directing your players what to do and how to do it, there are two things. One, especially at the pro level, you didn't pick the right players. And, or two, you didn't train them well to be ready for what was going to happen in the game. Hugo Sanz, that was who it was. And, and I look at that and I say, okay, that's a that's problem. That's a coach's problem. Your job as a coach is to shut up and sit there and figure out what's going on and what moves can I make um, to, 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 to help my team uh, get the result that I want to do and to get them to play better. That's, that's, that's the big deal. And that yapping at your team and directing stuff. Now that doesn't mean you don't do it during the game. Hey, push up a little bit tighter on him, you know, mark her a little bit tighter, that kind of stuff. You're doing that kind of stuff, but not the constant nonstop. If you're doing it, you pick the wrong players or two in coaching well during the game. That's my, my thoughts. Yeah. Yeah, well said, well said, and great all along. Um, in the chat, Matt Elmer has wrote, it was great, and thank you, Alan. I always want to be the voice of the people in the chat. Welcome. And yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I definitely hope uh, we can entice you back in the future. Um, but as for tonight's session, thanks, everyone, for attending and, and making it valuable. Uh, we will see you again in two weeks for a trivia knockout night. Uh, see if you can win some free stuff. So thank you very much.